fellow YouTubers, and fellow hams, whoever else might be watching. Well, this week, it's the third week of October 2022, and this marks the fourth year, the end of the fourth year, that I have been living in the RV on the road. Four years ago this week, uh, I left Fort Wayne, Indiana. I left a little bungalow house uh, that I had emptied out and sold, and I moved into this 31-foot 2001 Thor Class C RV. Uh, it's kind of big, it's like a big box truck, um, but basically it is a box. <laughs> the uh, living space, well, it's 31 feet bumper to bumper. The living space is more like about 25 feet um, or so. And uh, I think it's about eight feet wide, maybe nine feet wide, eight feet tall. Uh, that's the box. And absolutely everything that I own is contained within this box. So I uh, thought, since it's uh, been four years, which just amazes me, it doesn't feel like it's been that long, that I'd go ahead and do a thoughts um, on the road vlog and uh, talk a little bit about the things that I've learned about uh, nomadic living, um, van life, uh, living on the road in a vehicle um, over the last four years. Yeah, so uh, yeah, four years ago. Um, this is a map and it kind of shows my path roughly drawn in of where I've traveled so far over the four years. There's a lot of the country I haven't seen yet, but uh, I came pretty much straight south out of Indiana. The cold weather was coming in and I was trying to stay ahead of the cold as I went south. And uh, the first RV park that I stayed at, well, actually the first campsite that I stayed at was in Tennessee. And it was at the grave site of... Uh, I can't remember if it's Lewis or Clark, but Lewis and Clark were two explorers in the early days of uh, the conquest of this country that uh, went west and mapped out um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the continent. Uh, and one of them is buried there in Tennessee, and uh, I stayed there at, at the at the area where his uh, grave site is. is a big camping area there that's free, and I stayed there for my first night. Um, and, uh, well, that was actually my second night. I think my first night was at a rest area, <laughs> but, uh, um, it was all new, you know, it was all new to me then. I had read about, uh, nomadic uh, living on the road. Van life was just beginning to become popular. Um, so it was, uh, it was still fairly new. Uh, people were, had been doing this for years and years, of course, but uh, it was becoming more in the, the public's consciousness at that point. And I'd read about it, and I'd gotten interested in it. I'd wanted to minimize my life, and so um, I was off, you know, and uh, I was going. And uh, that first night at the campsite was, uh, was fun. It was all exciting. It was all new, you know. Uh, and then down in Mississippi, I stayed at my first RV park, a really great little place, uh, Cypress Hill. I think, yeah, Cypress Hill RV Park, just north of Hattiesburg. Um, great little place. Uh, not too expensive. But that was where I first, one of the first things that surprised me. Um, I guess I knew that there were people that were living full-time in RVs. But being from a city, I hadn't really thought about that, you know. And, and uh, there's like a general attitude, I think, that most people in the city would have if they if they saw an RV parked in a, like a Walmart parking lot and somebody told them, yeah, that guy lives in that thing full time, they would look down on them. Um, you know, like, oh, gee, he must be hard on his luck, you know, poor guy and, and all that. Uh, but what I discovered at that first RV park that surprised me was there were quite a few people that that was basically their home. They were living there full time in their RV. Uh, it was probably close to half of the residents at the park were just there. That was that was their address. <laughs> That's what they did, you know. Uh, the school bus um, in the area actually stopped there, and uh, you know parents would walk their kids up to the the front entrance of the park to get on the bus to go to school. You know that was just their home, and and, and that surprised me back then that there were so many people living full time in RVs. Of course, now that uh, that's not so much of a, a surprise, especially today with with the popularity of van life and movies like Nomadland, uh, which is a great movie. It follows a fictional character and her struggles. Um, she's really the, the focus of the story. But in the surround of that story, 
the environment and the places that they, they shot. Um, I've been to a lot of those pe places. I've met some of the people that are in the movie. They were real people. Uh, there's a very valid layer to Nomad Land that makes it an interesting movie to see, by the way. So if you're, you know, really interested, go watch that movie. Um, it, it's kind of a, it kind of has a sad slant to it because it's following this, this woman that, that has trials and troubles in her life that drove her to that um, existence. Uh, but that's only one example. There's a whole range of people living in RVs and vans. You know, you have re a lot of retirees that that's just what they want to do. You know, they retired and they're just traveling around. Um, and that's great. Traveling is fun. You get to see all kinds of new places and new geographies and new animals and new climates and, and meet new people and, and different people from different walks of life. And uh, yeah, different walks of life. It's a very broad crowd. It's not just one type of person living in an RV or a van. It's a very, very broad crowd. I've sat around campfires with a multimillionaire, a blue collar worker, um, an, an average Joe, somebody who's down on their luck, um, somebody who is what you might call homeless, um, you know, and, and everybody just, the conversation just flowed. We were all just people. There's kind of a camaraderie to it. So um, anyway, um, that first RV park was an eye-opener for me that there are so many people living full-time in RVs. And uh, from there, uh, the cold weather was still coming down. It was, you know, late October. Uh, so I began moving again, and uh, I went down... Um, I have to look at the map. I think I went down a little further south, went across uh, Louisiana, and down to the Gulf Coast of Texas, uh, which was my first long-term stay. Uh, I had a friend down there, Al, who's a ham, and he owns a, a little RV park there in Rockport, Texas, which again is a great little park. He's right on the coast. I mean, well, not right on the coast. He's like four blocks from the coast, but literally walking distance down to the ocean or down to the pier to go fishing, you know, and a uh, great little town has a, a all the uh, all the things you might hope to find. It's kind of a tourist town, but it's got big stores and it's got, you know, all, everything you'd need. And I spent um, a good part of the winter, I think, there before I continued on west. And again, at his place, there were several people that that's just where they lived. You know, they were living in their RVs and that was their address. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I was getting more comfortable at the time with um, the RV life because it, you know, it was like, you know, you're not really alone. I'm not really doing something... Uh, you, that unique, and uh, that felt kind of good. And I was staying out of the cold weather. That was a big deal for me. I was I was staying away from the snow. I mean, northern Indiana there in Fort Wayne, there are times in winter when it gets brutally cold. Uh, Sub-zero temperatures, Fahrenheit. Um, uh, I would wake up on some mornings in January and have a layer of frost on the inside of the front door of my house. It gets so cold there. So I was staying ahead of the cold. And this is all just in that first, you know, few months of the, of the trip. Uh, and then uh, it was uh, early uh, or late winter, I think. I went out, uh, continued out west. I'd been contacted by a ham, uh, James KB7TBT, who was at a place called Senator Wash in southwest Arizona. And I went out there. Um, this was where I discovered the long-term visitor areas in Arizona. Now, uh, this is a great way to keep your expenses down if you're set up to live off-grid in your RV. You know, if you have solar power, um, water tank holding tanks for your waste, um, and, you know, the ability to what they call boondocking, which I think is out, uh, fr it's from the old phrase out in the boondocks, uh, way, 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 way back. That's how they used to refer to the sticks or the country or way out of the city. They call it the boondocks. And so RVers call boondocking um what is what they what, well that's what they label camping off grid out uh remotely in the wilderness or you know away from a city away from an rv park away from from resources uh sometimes that's officially referred to as dispersed camping uh or dry camping um but uh anyway <clears throat> in southwest arizona uh that was also where i discovered that that's a huge mecca for the snowbirds you know quartzite area where i'm at now 
uh, it's, um, it's October, and uh, starting next month, there will be a huge, huge influx of RVers from all over the country and up in Canada. They all come down here for the winter because in this southwest corner of the country, the temperatures stay relatively mild. It might be the first week of January, and there will be days where you can walk around outside in jeans and a t-shirt and be totally comfortable. Uh, because it'll be, you know, still that kind of that warm and it won't get down below freezing at night. Uh, so Arizona uh, has these long-term visitor areas. There's several of them around Quartzsite. There's one up near Parker, which is about 30 miles north. And then there's the one down at Senator's Wash, Senator Wash, which I've done a video on, by the way. Search my channel for Senator Wash if you want to see it. It's a great place. Um... Uh, it's just north of Yuma, like 12 miles north of Yuma. So you've got a short drive to get supplies uh, and, a, and a really great big, huge area to camp in. Um, and they have a, a fee that's really low, $180, and you get to stay there for over six months. The season goes from September 15th to April 15th. Uh, so yeah, quite a long time. And uh, those areas, they have minimal resources. They have... Uh, fresh water, so you've got drinking water there you can fill your tanks with. Uh, they've got a dump station so you can empty your waste tanks, um, dumpsters for your trash, and that's it. Uh, you get all your power from solar or wind, uh, and uh, there's a lot of people. <laughs> it gets, uh, gets kind of crowded, especially in December and January. You know, so I spent the winter there and um, made a bunch of friends, um, met a lot of people, a lot of other hams. There's a whole little cluster of ham radio operators that sort of gather around that area and then uh, go up to Quartzsite for the big uh, Quartzfest ham radio RV or gathering in uh, January. So I spent the rest of the winter there, um, made some friends, met some people, um, met Tony and Jeannie, um, a couple of real good friends of mine that have a property up in Kingman, and uh, they invited me to visit up there in Kingman, and so I went up there, and I spent uh, um, a good chunk of the summer up there. I can't remember where I went after that, uh, but I know I kind of hung out out here in the southwest. I really grew to love the desert. Um, I, 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 it's peaceful. It's quiet most of the time. Monsoon season is changing and getting more aggressive with storms. So next summer, I don't think I'll be hanging out down here once monsoon season starts. But uh, let's see. Uh, I think I looped around Arizona for the next year or so. Uh, and then other people that I'd met had a place up in Oregon and invited me up there. So I, I spent a summer up there in, in Oregon. I went up the east side of the Cascades. Uh, back to the map, you can see how I went up the east side of the Cascades and uh, spent some time up there in Oregon, came back down um, I-5 through California because uh, mountain passes and hills. This is a 31-foot RV. It's huge. It's heavy. Um, I don't think the brakes are strong enough to lock the wheels up on this thing because of, you know, all of the mass and the weight on the wheels and the, the amount of friction because of that weight between the tires and the ground. I don't think I could lock the wheels up on it. And uh, mountain passes are no fun. It can go up them okay, you know. You just sort of get behind a semi that's doing 35, turn your flashers on, and uh, let the engine down, shift a bit, and whine, and just take your time going up the passes. But braking going down the other side, oh, I had a close call, and <laughs> it was terrifying. So I decided to avoid the mountain passes and came back down I-5, uh, back down here to southwest Arizona, and I've been sort of fluctuating a loop uh, up to Kingman, uh, to Tony and Jeannie's and back down here since. Uh, a lot of things have, you know, changed over the past few years um, with fuel prices. And the RV is old. This is a 2001. It was a rental. And um, my advice, if you're thinking about buying an RV, is don't buy a rental. Um, rental places don't really keep up their RVs very well. They don't repair them. They patch them. And so I had a lot of work to do on this thing to get it roadworthy when I first bought it. I got it cheap. I mean, you can get a rental cheap. I think I paid $8,000 for this thing, which is not a lot of money. Um, I had to put about 3000 more into it in, uh, in brakes and fluids and tune-up and filters and 
uh, sealing things up and, and caulking uh, gaps and stopping the leaks. Um, and, and, you know, I've got it uh, watertight now. It doesn't leak when it rains, but I had to put a lot of work and a lot of money in it to get it roadworthy. And it's still kind of rickety. It's uh, so far the drivetrain's okay, but I'm nervous about like an engine failure or transmission failure or something on the road. I've already had a blowout um, and, and replaced uh, all but one of the tires that was, I think the one, the one tire on the um, rear is still the tire that was on it when I bought it, but that's because that was a new tire when I bought it. But all the rest of them have been replaced now. So, you know, there's, there's expense there in maintaining the vehicle, uh, depending upon the vehicle you get, you know. So anyway, um, that's been the trip so far. There's a lot more of the country I would like to see. I'm just not that comfortable taking this thing on thousands of miles of, of road. So maybe in the near future, if I can get into a van, <laughs> I'll do some more traveling. It'll be far more convenient. So uh, this morning, I posted to the Facebook page, uh, the Old Tech Guy Facebook page group, that I was doing this video, and I asked people to give me some questions that they might want to have answered about RV life or road life or nomadic life and things that I've uh, <clears throat> learned during this trip. And I had a few that were pretty interesting and good, so we're going to address some of those questions. Uh, so let's have a look here. Um... One question, and I get this question a lot. Uh, David Hott asks, I've been considering doing this. My question is, what are the average monthly living expenses on the road? That's hard to answer uh, because there's just too many variables. You know, it, it depends a lot on your lifestyle. If you're a retiree and you bought a, a big RV and you're just going to travel and spend all your time at RV parks. And there's, there's people that do that. That's all they do is go RV park to RV park to RV park. Uh, it's real easy because you get all the amenities you need at the RV parks. You know, you get your water, dump, trash, electricity. Uh, there's always like laundry facilities sometimes on the, at the resort sites. There'll be like swimming pools, tennis courts, things to do, you know. And there's, there's people that do that. They just go RV park to RV park and that's how they spend their time. Uh, that's probably the most expensive way to do it. Um, RV parks, they, especially the resorts with all the amenities, can be quite expensive. You know, $60, $70 a night. Um, maybe as much as five, six hundred dollars a month if you're going to stay there a month or more. Uh, some of them can be eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month if they are, you know, really fancy. And a lot of those resort places also will have rules like no RVs older than ten years. You know, they they don't want people like me staying there. <laughs> And that's fine, you know, because it kind of goes the other way, too. I don't want to stay around um, places like that um, where people look down on you, look down their nose at you a lot of times and, and somehow think that uh, they're important when they're just as equally unimportant as all the rest of us. Um, I'm, I'm of the view that we're all irrelevant. <laughs> we're just human beings on the surface of the planet living our lives, you know, and uh, nobody's more important or special than somebody else. Uh, anyway, um, so that's the most expensive way to live. On the converse of that, the cheapest way to live, I've seen people living in cars. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of them, actually. Uh, there's people out here in the desert that I see living in cars. Uh, just a small, compact car uh, is probably the other end of the spectrum. And uh, they can get by with very little money. Uh, they don't have a big fuel expense. Um, if they're smart with their uh, food shopping and groceries, you know, they don't have a big food expense. They can park just about anywhere uh, if they're stealthy, you know, so they, they don't really have expenses there. Uh, you, can, um, uh, you can rely on public services, like, uh, you know, get a plan on getting a cup of coffee at McDonald's in the morning so you can use their restroom you know, or go and do your grocery shopping at Walmart and then use the restroom there, you know, so you don't even have to worry about uh, um, waste. Uh, so that's, you know, the cheap end of the spectrum. Uh, in the middle, uh, somebody like me, I boondock most of the time. I'm, I'm off grid most of the time. I will occasionally overnight at an RV park uh, to do laundry, get a nice long hot shower instead of, you know, the, the Mariner shower that you do in an RV. Uh, water is a resource. You know, you, you don't want to use too much of it. You don't just turn the faucet on when you're washing your hands. You, 
you dribble it, get your hands wet, turn it off, soap up, turn it on a little bit, and rub your hands under the stream to, to wash the soap and dirt away, and then turn it off. You know, you, you really have to be conservative with your water usage. Uh, um, but uh, doing that, I, my expenses aren't too bad, you know. Um, I've, I've made friends that have properties that I can stay on. Um, Al down there in Texas would let me come and stay at his RV park uh, very cheaply. Um, Tony and Jeannie, my friends up in Kingman, they let me stay on their property for a visit for a time or months. Or, you know, there's, there's times where I've, uh, in exchange for the place to park, I was caretaker of the property while they traveled. You know, you can barter that way. Uh, there are jobs at... Um, many of these campsites called a camp host where somebody is there full time and they just answer questions for people and and you know clean the bathrooms and maintain pick up trash and just maintain the place uh and they get to park there for free plus they get a small amount of uh, pay for doing that you know so there's there's all kinds of ways you can get by fairly cheaply um my expenses it's really hard to quantify um anywhere from around Oh, 200 to 400 a month on average. You know, sometimes a little more. It depends on what's due that month. Okay, another question. Uh, probably one of the best questions. I, uh, Edward Clayton asks, I'm interested in how your perceived, preconceived ideas differ from the reality of it and thoughts on what you might have done differently. A lot of people have preconceptions about van life. Um, if you look at YouTube and the videos that are out there, they all make it look like it's roses and bluebirds and, and uh, happy times all the time. Uh, and, you know, they're going for clicks. They're going for views. They're, they're trying to oversell things just to get the excitement and, you know, and all that. Uh, the reality is it's just life. Um, it's really no different. It, it grinds me when somebody says, well, you're just on a permanent vacation. Hardly. <laughs> You can go home from a vacation, right? This isn't a permanent vacation. This is still life. I still have to do all the same things that other people have to do, just differently. I have to obtain my resources. Uh, it's actually a little more work in some ways. You know, at a house, you have everything pumped to your house. Your waste is pumped away in pipes. A, a guy comes by to take your trash once a week. You know, all, all that's done for you in the RV you have to do everything yourself. I think when I started, I realized that to a degree, but I didn't think it was going to be as much work as it is. Um, the one thing that I did not anticipate was how difficult it is to find places to park. Just about every city or town will have an RV park, so that's always that option. But if you don't want that expense, it's very, very hard to find places that are safe to park, especially in a big RV like this. Uh, aside from rest areas, some businesses will allow it in some places, like Walmart. You can overnight in a Walmart parking lot. They don't want you staying there for days and days and days, obviously. Uh, but you can overnight there, and they, they realize that the people that do are usually going to come in and buy something. So, you know, they, they don't mind. You just park at the back of the parking lot where you're out of the way, and usually they'll let you alone. But in general... It's really difficult uh, when you're traveling. Uh, you got to really do a lot of research, plan ahead, make phone calls, figure out where you're going to park along your trip. If you're going, you know, states, going across states, uh, and you're going to spend time in locations, you got to do a lot of research and a lot of work. Society in general is very, very unfriendly uh, to nomadic people. Uh, you're generally looked down upon, um, or you're looked at with suspicion. You know, they, they're, oh, that guy's living in an RV, better watch out for him. Maybe he's going to come and try to steal my stuff or something. You know, people just look at you that way. Not everybody, but kind of generally. Um, no bads are really looked down on. So I didn't anticipate that. What would I do differently? Um, I would have bought a van back then when you could afford them. And a small trailer is what I would have done differently. Um, I would get a, a, a like a sprinter van that I could make into a livable space, and then a small trailer so I could take advantage of places like these LTVAs. They, they won't let you park out here unless you have a holding tank for your waste, you know. So you got to have a trailer or a camper van that has at least a 10-gallon holding tank. So I would have got a van and a small trailer. 
that would have made traveling far more convenient and I would have done a lot more traveling. And I still would like to do that, but unfortunately now with the van life craze, the market for vans has gone to ridiculous amounts. Uh, even a, a junky used high mileage uh, sprinter van is going to cost sixty, eighty thousand dollars. You know, I mean, that's it's more than twice what I paid for that bungalow house that I had in Fort Wayne just for a used crappy vehicle. Yeah, it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But that's what I would have done differently. I would have got a van and a small trailer, and then uh, I would have spent the winters down here avoiding the cold weather in the trailer, and then stored the trailer somewhere and spent the summers uh, driving around the country in the van, which would I could afford to. I mean, you can get 15 to 17 miles to the gallon in those vans, whereas this thing uh, averages around five. So it's it's a huge difference. So that's what I would have done differently. Okay, how long have we been talking here? Probably too long. Ooh, wow, 26 minutes. Okay, let's just look at a couple of quick questions here. Um, I had another good one here. Uh, Craig Gillibreth wanted to know, um, yeah, well, I've kind of touched on that. Uh, the van life, people are always, you know, talking all positive about it. You know, what's what's the dark side? And I've kind of covered that. Uh, Gary Harper, how do you find uh, the change from one box to another? I've already kind of covered that too, Gary. Uh, you know what? Let's just do one more question here. Oh, well, okay. How do you earn a living? Uh, Richard I. Lay wants to know. I think I've talked about this before. Obviously, uh, YouTube advertising revenue, um, which is pretty small. I get paid for now it's down to about 13% of my views. The rest of the people are running ad blockers, so I don't get... Okay, I have been talking a lot. <laughs> the camera cut off. I hit the file max size on that one clip, so it restarted. Where was I? What was I talking about? Uh, how do you earn a living? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, YouTube. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, I only get paid for about 13% of my views. The rest of the people are running ad blockers, so I don't get any compensation uh, for their views. So YouTube's revenue is pretty small. Um, right now, I get somewhere between 80 to 100,000 views a month, and that translates to around uh, 230 to $300 a month. Uh, most of my income comes from my Patreon supporters. Guys, thank you very much. If it wasn't for you guys, I would be homeless. Uh, and uh, that's usually around $800 a month. So I, I earn a, around uh, anywhere from about twelve dollars to $14,000 a year. Um, it varies. So it's not a lot, but as I mentioned, you know, I, I keep things fairly cheap here. I, I'm going to spend the winter months here at the LTVA. So it's $180 to have a place to park for six months. That's half the year, you know. Uh, so all I've got then is my food and uh, cigars, because I smoke cigars. It's the only vice I got left, you know, and occasional bits of uh, kit and radio stuff uh, for doing channel content. So that's, you know, that's how I earn my income. Um, and, and, you know, I'm living off, like I said, twelve to 14000 a year. So you can, you can do it fairly cheaply. I know people that have retirement um, benefits income that's higher than that. You know, so it really depends on what you can survive on. You know, how, how many amenities and, and nice things you want to have and comforts and how much you can uh, just, you know, take care of yourself. And one final question to deal with here uh, that I thought was hilarious. Rick Jones, how do you pick up chicks when living in an RV? <laughs> okay, I won't comment on the use of the word chick, uh, but uh, social life and uh, dating. I thought that that's an interesting question, a topic to, to touch on. I can't directly uh, provide an answer to that because personally, I haven't really had any interest in, in dating or relationships for years now. Um, I've kind of got to been there, done that attitude but I have observed uh, the people around me. You know, I pay attention to the people around me and the and the the things that happen and the, and all that. It's uh, it's interest. Sociology is interesting to me. Um, the problem with nomadic dating that I can see is nomads tend to be wanderers. You might say drifters. You know, they, they get itchy feet. They don't want to stay in one place for very long. I have that now too. I I don't know if I could live in a house. Um, again, 
I probably couldn't live in a city again. I, I really like the peace of the country, but back to the subject. Uh, nomads, if they're going to get into a relationship with other nomads, they've, they've got to have a similar path, you know? They've got to be wanting to drift and wander in the same directions into the same destinations for that to work. So I guess dating would be a little more difficult uh, for a nomadic lifestyle. Most people's camper vans or RVs are set up for their needs, you know, and uh, it's like their space, kind of like their room in the house. Uh, and uh, I have seen people that have uh, have met up and uh, got into a relationship, and one of them has has sold their RV and they've consolidated into a bigger RV. But that seems to be rare. A lot of times, it seems to me that, and this is all speculation, just based on observation. It seems to me that dating between RVers doesn't tend to last very long. You know, they'll travel together for a while and then they'll split up, you know, and it's it probably because one of them gets drawn to this and the other one gets drawn to that and they can't agree and they're like, okay, we just go their separate ways, you know. So I, uh, I imagine that uh, dating would be more of a challenge. Um, you definitely would have plenty of opportunities to meet people uh, at the RV parks that I've stayed at. Uh, they have events. They usually have a rec room and they'll have like Christmas dinners and potlucks, and dances and movie nights and game nights, board game nights and stuff like that, card game nights. You know, they'll have events where people get together. Uh, and uh, I have met couples that live at an RV park. I guess that would be a difference. People that actually live at an RV park in their RV probably have a better chance of having a social life because they're going to meet somebody that also lives at the RV park and you're basically like two people that live in the same city at that point. So, you know, uh, in fact, I've, I've met couples that are in long-term relationships that live in RV parks. So that would be easier. But if you're on the road, I think that uh, if you were actively interested in dating and relationships, you'd probably have a difficult time of it because the people you meet, there's, there's a strong sense of individuality. That's a way to look at it. Yeah. The people that I have met that are nomadic, they're very much individuals. You know, they, they, they tend to do their own thing to, to develop their own environment, their own world around them. And they're happy and content with that. And uh, that would make uh, a dating relationship would be kind of like an intrusion into your space, I guess. So... Anyway, that's all speculation. Um, like I say, I really can't give you a direct answer because it's, it's just not my thing now. Okay, I have babbled on for way too long, but uh, I just wanted to kind of touch on a few things there. I hope that I answered um, most of the questions that people might have. Of course, you can also leave questions down in the video comments and I will uh, answer them, you know, if, if, if I can. And uh, yeah. I guess that's that. So yeah, four years, man. Four years on the road. I, I can't believe it's been four years, but uh, it has. So uh, hopefully if, uh, wow, if things go my way, maybe if I hit the lottery, I'll get myself a, a camper van and a trailer and start traveling more and uh, putting up some more media. You know, I, I really enjoy, one last thought, for me, the things that I really enjoy about this lifestyle is that the view outside my window changes. You know, I can sit on my couch and gaze out my window. Right now I see a, a vast desert plain with some scrub brush and small stunted trees and mountains off in the distance and a huge sky with puffy white clouds. And uh, I enjoy that. But there have been times in the past where I've sat on my couch and looked out my window at container ships going by on the oceans and, and dolphins porpoising or at uh, a green forest uh, with birds and squirrels and the sound of a black bear busting through the brush way up the hill, you know? <laughs> the, the environment outside my door changes. Inside here, I still feel like I'm home. I can close the windows at night and it doesn't matter where I'm parked, I'm home, you know? I just feel like I'm home. But as soon as I step out that door, the world outside changes and it's different geography, it's different smells, it's different sounds, it's different animals. You know, I really like to watch nature. I, I really enjoy the sunsets sitting outside the door and just, you know, listening to the animals. Out here it's the coyote 
great horned owls, thrushes and cactus wrens chirping. Um, the sounds of insects are different. Everything's different. It's, it's like you're, you're moving through the world, and I really enjoy that. And so I want to keep doing this because of that. I don't think I could ever live in a house again. I think I'd get itchy feet within six months and, 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 and want to go. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the plus side for me. Moving through the world, feeling like I'm part of the world, like I'm a human being on the face of the planet, instead of just inside of these rectangular boxes in a, in a, in a city of concrete and more rectangular boxes, you know. Uh, there's a sterile feeling to the cities and a claustrophobic feeling to the cities for me now. Out here in the big open spaces, life just feels more alive. And I'm going to keep doing it for as long as I can. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.